If you talk to me on Discord or you follow me on DeviantArt, two things you should totally do, by the way, you know I am a huge fan of How to Train Your Dragon. I've drawn tons of fan art. I have tons of merch like figurines and plushies and t-shirts. I've seen all the movies, all the shows. I've played all the games. I've done pretty much everything that has to do with How to Train Your Dragon. So, naturally, as a result, I eventually heard about MatPat's theory video called How to Not Train Your Dragon. I first discovered this on the How to Train Your Dragon subreddit, and people were tearing it to shreds. They were saying that MatPat contradicted himself a lot, that he has no idea what he's talking about, that he doesn't take a lot of things into regard when he's talking about whatever theory it is that he's making. So... I thought it would be kind of a cool idea to look at that video and see what he got right, if he gets anything right, if he has some good theories, or if it's really as bad as everybody says it is. As you can tell, this video is not scripted in any way whatsoever, and this is my first time watching the video, so it'll be sort of a reaction slash debate type thing. Uh, you'll, you'll see what I mean as we get into it. Let's just start the video, shall we? Wiki how to train your dragon. All right, step one, live in a world with dragons. <laughs> Glad to hear they're starting with the essentials. Step two, almost kill a dragon. Wouldn't seem to engender a lot of loyalty to me, but okay. Step three, wait until the dragon develops Stockholm Syndrome? should know better than to trust wiki how maybe the movie has better advice now i'm gonna say this even if it's fake the intro to this video kind of throws me off a little bit because it kind of seems like he comes across this article and that was the thing that gave him the idea to make this video and just to see if it was fake or not i went looking for this article and obviously it is fake all i could really find was Articles that talked about like how to make dragon costumes, how to draw dragons. There was one article that had to deal with how to train your dragon, and it was called Wiki How to Train Your Dragon, but uh, instead of talking about the movies, it talked about different dragons from the books, and it would list off all the ways how to train those dragons. So obviously, this article that my pet is looking at is fake. It just throws me off a little bit because it's playing off the fact that it seems like, you know, again, he came across this and that gave him the idea. But, you know, that's just a minor thing. Let's get into the rest of the video and see how bad it is. Hello, Internet! Welcome to Film Theory! Hey, Hollywood, we need some new franchises in theaters, alright? I mean, just look at the film lineup for the rest of 2019. A reboot of Men in Black, remakes of Dumbo, Aladdin, and Lion King, and sequels to Avengers, Spider-Man, Star Wars, Jumanji, Rambo, Terminator, Fast and Furious, Frozen, Angry Birds, Toy Story, and The Secret Life of Pets! It's like horror films don't scare Hollywood executives. Their actual nightmare is creating new new and creative screenplays. Cue the air horn because that was a sick but predictable burn. <laughs> One such sequel that premiered earlier this year was How to Train Your Dragon. Now, this is a franchise we've never covered here, mostly because I'd never seen the movies up until recently, but having just caught up with the franchise after a few really long flights, I'm finally sinking my teeth into these tales of Toothless by addressing the biggest question that comes out of the whole theatrical empire. Not could dragons exist, no, not how do massive lizards fly, it is way more obvious than that. Today I am going to answer the question of how do you train train your dragon? And the answer is, not like you see in the movie. I mean, I know the movie makes it seem all magical and heartwarming, but when you look at the realities of what's actually going on on screen, the entire premise goes up in flames. You should not train your dragon. And I'm not talking about, oh, dragon training would be dangerous because they'll eat you and they'll burn you with their hot fire. No, the entire concept of training your dragon is simply broken at a fundamental level. And you definitely shouldn't do it the way that Hiccup does in the movies. So saddle up, Vikings of questionable geographic origin. Sure you want that kid running the village? It is time to theorize. All right, I just want to point out one thing real quick towards the end of that clip when Matt Pat says that the Vikings are of questionable geographic origin. 
Aside from the main cast of kids, everybody's accents are pretty much what you would expect from where they come from. It's not really specified as to where exactly they are, but it's somewhere up north, obviously, off the coast of, like, uh, Norway or something like that. It obviously takes place where Vikings actually were way back when. So that that's just a little, like, what? <laughs> um... Also, I'm really interested to see what he's talking about when he says that the method of training a dragon is fundamentally broken. Should should be interesting, but I can already feel like like what what everybody was talking about on Reddit. <laughs> I feel like this isn't gonna be good. For anyone who was like me and missed out on this franchise, here's basically what you need to know for today's theory. Hiccup lives on the island of Burke with his father, the Chief. Burke is prone to frequent dragon attacks, so, like most people being tormented by a species of wild animals, they fight back. In one of the dragon attacks, Hiccup injures an elusive Night Fury dragon that he eventually names Toothless and befriends. Over the course of the film, through his interactions with Toothless, Hiccup learns that dragons are really just glorified cats that can be won over with beams of light, chin scratches, and dragon nips. Children in Burke's society have to undergo a process known as dragon training. I, I think it's time you learn to fight, fight dragons. dragons. You go first. You get your wish. Dragon training. You start in the morning. Oh man, I should have gone first. And Hiccup skyrockets in popularity as his tactics serve as a non-violent model to follow for the rest of the village. By the end of the film, everyone in the village has their own pet dragon, completely forgetting that these are enormous, deadly, wild creatures who were literally at their throats only a few hours before. Sure, they were being mind-controlled by a giant dragon overlord, but still, you've been fighting these things for generations, and now you're like, oh, look at how cute they are. No, stupid, bad idea. And this episode's gonna tell you why. See, now my only the issue so far is what he said at the end of this clip when he says that oh everybody has their own pet dragons like they totally forgot how giant and deadly and dangerous these dragons are they know how dangerous dragons are if you watch the tv shows like on cartoon network and netflix anytime they encounter a wild dragon be it a species they just discovered or a species they are very familiar with they always approach it with extreme caution. Just because they have a pet dragon does not mean that they're totally okay with all dragons. They know how dangerous these creatures are. Like, it, like that, that part is just like... Like, yes, the dragons are cute, but they know how dangerous they are. Hiccup knows how fucking detrimental the damage would be if Toothless just fired off even a couple of shots in Burke. It would destroy the whole village. They're fully aware of this. Like, that that part of the argument is just a little bleh to me. Now, let me make one thing clear. By the end of the movie, what we see aren't trained dragons, they're domesticated dragons. That may seem like a minor point, but it's actually a huge difference. You see, in the real world, we use a lot of words about animals interchangeably that aren't really the same at all. And when it comes to training a dragon, the difference between words like train and domesticate is the difference between getting you the world's most awesome pet and you getting personally barbecued to death. So let's get our definition straight. To tame an animal is to take an individual wild animal and make that specific animal not afraid of you as a human. To to train an animal is to get it to repeatedly follow a command. You blow a whistle, your dog sits. To domesticate an animal is the most intense of these three, and requires fundamentally altering the species over many generations via selective breeding, basically transforming it to behave the way that humans want. So today we're going to address the possibility of all three, but specifically focus on training, since, you know, that's the title of the movie. Now, I will give Matt Pat this. There is a pretty big difference on training, taming, and domesticating an animal. There's a pretty big difference, especially if we're talking about domestication. We'll get to that in a little bit. Um, in my opinion, though, the dragons in How to Train Your Dragon are actually tamed and then trained. I don't think that they're at all domesticated, because if that was the case, the Burkeans would be trying to breed certain dragons together to get certain traits. For example, if they wanted a deadly natter scaled down to size to like a terrible terror, they would be breeding the smaller deadly natters together to make 
even smaller deadly natters. They would do the same with a monstrous nightmare and a zippleback, and honestly, that would solve a lot of problems for the Burkeans, but they never do that because the dragons are more tamed than trained. Toothless was a wild dragon that Hiccup had to tame to get his trust to show that he is not a threat to the dragon, and then Hiccup had to train Toothless. I don't think he ever domesticated him, because then, like I said, he would be trying to breed Toothless with other dragons to get other traits to make less dangerous dragons. <laughs> like, that's just kind of my interpretation of it, especially since Burke has always been kind of seen as a dragon sanctuary, where lots of rescued dragons are taken to be safe from dragon hunters and the like. That's just how I've always kind of seen it. If anybody disagrees, feel free to let me know in the comments or message me on Twitter or Facebook or whatever. Now Hiccup, for all his supposed dragon knowledge, is not the example of proper training that the people of Burke should be following. What he does is dangerous, destructive, and worst of all, inhumane. Now that may sound extreme until you take a second look at the events of this film without all the sappy feel-good music. What happens to kick off this entire movie? Hiccup injures Toothless, wrecking his tail flap. An injury that completely grounds Toothless. I mean, tooth, toothless. <laughs> Dragon without parts. So we are starting the relationship with a critical injury, and then it proceeds to get even worse. Hiccup moves on to reconstruct a new tailpiece for Toothless, and while well, it's all real nice and good that he worked so gosh darn hard on it, it was repairing an injury that was his own fault. And as soon as that tailpiece is on, guess what Toothless does? Does he turn around and thank Hiccup? Does he tearfully tell him that he'll miss their companionship? No! He flies away. He tries to escape the human predator, like a wild animal should and would do in that moment. But even then, Hiccup can't leave well enough alone because he hangs on through the air and discovers, super conveniently, that the dragon can only fly if he, Master Human, is controlling the prosthetic tailpiece. Just think about that for a second. This would be like clipping a bird's wings, then replacing its wingtips with remote control wingtips so he could fly him around like a model airplane. When you really think about what's going on here to a wild animal who's scared and injured, it would be immediately classified as animal cruelty, or at the very least, a pretty barbaric way to get a big animal to do what you want. And Hiccup sees no problem here. In fact, he spends most of his time riding Toothless around, congratulating himself about how amazing he is. Yes! Yes! I did it! Okay, yeah, I can definitely see what people on the subreddit were talking about, because I already have a few issues with this bit alone. First off, MapHat makes it sound like Hiccup purposefully shot Toothless down to get rid of his tail fin so that he could make a prosthetic to control Toothless and basically turn him into his slave pet type thing. Which isn't the case. Hiccup shot down Toothless to prove himself to his father and the other Vikings, that he was one of them. Nobody had ever even seen a Night Fury before, let alone kill one. So he wanted to prove himself by killing the most elusive dragon known to Vikings. He didn't know that a Night Fury needs those two tail fins to keep itself balanced in the air. He had no idea. So that whole theory of him purposefully shooting down the dragon to manipulate it after injuring it is like very shaky, especially when he makes it sound like Hiccup made the prosthetic again just to manipulate Toothless. That isn't the case. He made it because when he found Toothless grounded in the uh, ravine, he wanted to help Toothless get out. He felt sorry for trying to kill him and wanted to save him. He didn't even have any intention to technically train the dragon. He just wanted to help it get out, and Toothless only saw Hiccup as a way of survival. Hiccup brought him food, and he also gave him the ability to fly again, even if momentarily. That's why he didn't turn around and be like, oh, I'm gonna miss you, blah, 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 because they've literally only known each other for a couple of days. Like, the, this whole thing is just on very shaky ground. Like, I don't know where he's getting this idea <laughs> of Hiccup knowingly shooting down a Night Fury to get rid of its tail fin when nobody even knew what a Night Fury looked like. It's, it's very, very 
strange to me, but let's keep going. After that, he goes on to chase down the dragon to get a saddle on it. Again, not voluntary since Toothless will literally die if he can't fly. Then has to iterate all kinds of reins and turning systems to control the dragon, instead of rigging a system where, you know, Toothless could control it himself. Hiccup doesn't design or even attempt to design something that would allow Toothless to fly independently until the short film Gift of the Night Fury. And even then, he still has systems in place that allow him to maintain control. It's like saying to your dog, I love ya, as long as I still have the ability to shock collar you. It's only in the third and final film that Hiccup finally respects this animal enough that he designs something that makes him completely independent. Meanwhile, every time Hiccup falls, Toothless crashes headfirst into the ground at full speed, or directly into cliff faces. Even when his control system works and Hiccup is managing to navigate, think about what's happening here. Sure, it looks epic and they're working like a team, but in reality, this dragon is a helpless passenger in his own body. Body. He is a slave, and no matter how many times it happens, he only has one choice but to keep going. Because again, a dragon that can't fly is a dead dragon. The long story short here is that whether he had good intentions or no, Hiccup used force to train his dragon. He stripped away its independence and Toothless was required to submit to it. So what should Hiccup have done to train his dragon? Okay, a few more issues I have with this. And I can already hear people saying, Oh, it's just a theory. It's not meant to be taken seriously. I had a couple people telling me that when I first started talking about making this video. Yes, I understand that it's just a theory. That's the slogan of the channel. I know it's not meant to be taken super seriously. My issue is that it is such a stretch. It is such a loosely based theory that relies on cherry picking and over exaggerating. For example, MatPat says that Hiccup built the tailfin and the saddle specifically just to control Toothless, and while yes, that is kind of true, that's currently the only way Hiccup knew how to get Toothless to fly. He made it so that Toothless could fly. That's That was his goal the whole time. He wanted Toothless to be able to fly, and currently the only way he could do that is if he was kind of in control and Toothless let him do that. Toothless is fully aware of what is going on. He's not miserable. He trusts Hiccup to fly him very steadily and very safely. The whole him stripping Toothless of his independence by taking his tail fin off again goes back to what I said about the fact that nobody knew what a Night Fairy looked like. Nobody knew that they need tail fins to fly. Hiccup had no idea what he was getting himself into when he shot Toothless down. That's my issue with this theory. It cherry picks a few different things. Another thing I would like to point out, MatPat says that Hiccup used force to train his dragon, which isn't true. It's shown that he's very gentle with his dragon, you know? He holds his hand out to Toothless to show that he can trust him. He gently, like, knocks over a basket of fish to feed him. He keeps his distance for the most part until they're able to fly together. If Hiccup really did want to train this dragon using force, he would do something like Drago, restraining it and screaming at it until it submitted to him out of fear, or even beating it like what Krogan from the Netflix show did to his dragons. He would physically capture and then beat his dragons to make them submit. He never did that. There's literally no evidence to show that Hiccup did that to Toothless, and that's my issue with this video. It's cherry picking at its finest. Also, one last thing. This is just a me being a fucking nerd. Uh, he says that a dragon that can't fly is a dead dragon. That was true for a while, but uh, <laughs> speed stingers and cavern crashers exist. Just saying. Well, it comes as no great surprise to anyone that it would at the very least be a lot harder to train a gigantic lizard than it looks like here. But is there any world where this is possible? Using anything even remotely like the real methods of animal training, could you train your dragon? Maybe there's a way that this story could have turned out better. Maybe we call it Film Theory's Guide to How to Actually Train Your Dragon. It's catchy. Maybe it just needs an acronym. F-T-G-H-T-A-T-Y-D. Hooray! So let's 
look at what Hiccup should have done if he were actually training a dragon, or any kind of reptile that even remotely resembles a dragon, because I want to give him a fighting chance here. Referring to reputable zoo and reptile resource guides, the FTGHTATYD immediately encounters a few issues other than its terrible name, because in most places you look that respond to the question of how do I train my reptile, they answer with, eh, you don't. To quote Safer Pets, an online resource about training and caring for exotic animals, quote, first, it's important for you to realize that your pet lizard will never be like a dog or even a cat. You will never be able to have the same level of interactions and trick training as with a pet dog. If this is what you're after, then you might be better to consider a different sort of pet. Maybe not with that attitude, safer pets. No, but seriously, why are they so negative towards this whole thing? Is it just that we haven't spent the last few millennia domesticating our local crocodiles and that's why they're not willing to play fetch? Well, no. It turns out that the problem with training your dragon or any other reptile starts with the brain. Have you ever heard anyone refer to their lizard brain? You usually use the phrase when you're referring to some impulse decision or reaction that you just can't control, like your involuntary reaction to a jump scare in a horror movie, or how I seem to eat the entire box of springtime Oreos before I even realize it. Every single spring, they're the basic Oreos, but I still am like, oh, they're yellow frosted, great! These are all primal reactions. It tastes good, so eat it. It's scary, so run away. These lizard brain actions are controlled by the three most most primal areas of our brain, the brain stem, the cerebellum, and the basal ganglion, which aptly enough are the same areas of the brain we share with lizards, including reptiles. Reptile brains are just much smaller than mammal brains relative to body size because they only need to have these three areas. For reference, a saltwater crocodile and a horse have almost identical weight ranges, from 800 to 2,200 pounds. A crocodile brain weighs in at about 8.4 to 15 grams while a horse's brain weighs in at 530 to 655 grams. So why are their brains so much bigger? Well, humans and other mammals, like dogs and cats, have other areas of the brain layered on top of those primal areas, called the limbic system, which allow us to have more complex emotions, like how dogs experience excitement to see their owners, or depression when they're abandoned. The limbic system also enables us to develop trust and behavioral pattern recognition that allows us to train and be trained. Reptiles literally don't have the parts of the brain necessary to develop relationships with humans. Their brains are missing the emotional cognition to be trained to do the types of tricks that you see in How to Train Your Dragon. Now, MatPat here does have a good point. Reptile brains are a lot more simple than mammalian brains, so I can see where he's going if, obviously he's talking about, like, a, if a dragon was real and if it had the same brain as a simple tiny little lizard rather than the almost more mammalian brains that are in how to train your dragon however i still have some bad feelings about what he might say here a little bit i feel like he's going to compare real life reptiles to the dragons of how to train your dragon rather than painting a more realistic depiction of what a dragon would be like in this world but I guess we'll see. Let's keep going. No, oh, come on! I hear you saying there's videos on YouTube of people training lizards like Komodo dragons. Duh! They even have dragon in their name! But that kind of lizard training looks very different than training a cat and a dog. The most advanced dragon trainers in the world, who work with big lizards like Komodo dragons, can only train them to do what's known as target practice. Lifting a rifle onto their shoulder and shooting at a target downrange. I just did that to see if you were paying attention. No, you cannot train your lizard to shoot a gun. Target practice here means means basically classical conditioning for your dinner. Instead of throwing some mice or other animals into the reptile's habitat, trainers take a target, basically a ball or a plate on a stick, into the enclosure and train the reptile to touch the target in order to get its food. That's it. Like, that is the level of training that you can do for your dragon. The end. Biologically speaking, it is impossible to do much more than that. And the reason trainers typically even bother doing this is to help move reptiles to different areas of their 
enclosure to receive things like medical care or give them exercise, not become helpful pets or even show off for the zoo visitors. Reptiles in captivity are known for being lazy and lethargic because they don't have to defend their territory anymore. Their lizard brain is no longer needed for survival, so the only way to get them appropriate activity is to get them to work for their food. Even the crocodile hunter himself, Steve Irwin, describes using himself as bait in crocodile enclosures so the crocs would regain their sense of territorialism and fend him off to get their blood pumping. This is a very rudimentary form of training, and it certainly isn't for fun. It's because to keep the reptiles healthy, they have to use their instincts, because that's the only thinking that they're capable of doing. Anything you train a reptile to do isn't them being loyal to you, it's just them using an instinct. All that said, for all you reptilian apologists out there, it's important to understand the difference between intelligence and emotional complexity. Reptiles are extremely smart, so just because they're not emotionally capable doesn't mean they're not capable. Capable. They have memories that span almost their whole lifetime, and big reptiles like alligators can navigate 30 to 40 miles of waterways easily from when they're born, which can be said for basically none of us who are working on or watching this video because human babies are virtually useless. Reptiles are also pretty much the kings of Darwinism, where a lot of female reptiles will only give the green light, so to speak, to the biggest, strongest male in their area, meaning that the only genes that get passed down are from the very best of their species. But we as humans, who don't really care about that and instead just want a cuddly iguana, can't mistake all of that for love, or loyalty, or trust, or any of the emotions that we hope to get out of a real pet. Reptiles still aren't domesticated after all these millennia, but that means that whether you're adopting a dragon from the wild, or you're picking up a chameleon at the pet store, literally the pet that I wanted all throughout elementary school, you are adopting the equivalent of a wild animal. So, how do you train your dragon? One, you set realistic expectations that you won't ever have a true relationship with them. Two, you bait them around an enclosure to give them lots of exercise. And three, you appreciate that they're instinctually way smarter than us, but don't know how to brag about it. Relationships just don't figure into that equation. Now, I actually don't have that much of an issue with this part of the video. I'm not gonna tear it to shreds like I did with the beginning of it. He, he does have a point, like I said earlier. Lizard brains are literally just less developed than human brains. The extent that you can go to training an actual lizard is, like he said, baiting them around their enclosure, teaching them to touch certain things so that they get food. I think some people have managed to train their lizards to do obstacle courses, but that's about it. So sure, in a realistic sense, if dragons were real, and they had the same mind as lizards, that would be fine and dandy. The only issue I can kind of see is that he compared, not really compared, but he kind of showed clips from How to Train Your Dragon, like, oh, it would be impossible to train a dragon the way they did in How to Train Your Dragon because, oh, they're lizards, their brains aren't developed enough, even though they were shown to have brains similar to mammals. They can feel emotions, they can be trained to do lots of different things, but again, that's not the main part of that part of the video. It was more so just explaining a realistic scenario with real dragons. So I don't have that big of an issue with it. Um, other than that though, this video was not very good. <laughs> uh, the beginning was jumping to a lot of conclusions, cherry picking for sure. Um, it just didn't seem all that genuine, and I know, again, it is a theory, it's not meant to be taken seriously, but in my opinion, if you're going to make a theory about a film or a video game or a show or whatever, it needs to be consistent with certain points. You can't just cherry pick something and put those together and say, this is what's actually going on. You have to take everything else into consideration. So that's my issue with this video. And I think that's a lot of other people's issue with this video. I don't think it's as horrendous as people were making it out to be. On the How to Train Your Dragon subreddit, people were tearing it to shreds, saying that it was offensive, that MatPat had no idea what he was talking about. And while I kind of agree with that part, I don't think it's offensive. It just, like I said, it cherry picks. Uh, other than that though, not the worst video on the planet, could have been better. Maybe we'll get some better How to Train Your Dragon Theory videos. That would be really cool. But yeah, I think those are my thoughts on this for now. 
just I wanted to give my thoughts on it as a super big fan of How to Train Your Dragon. Um, if anybody here likes MatPat's videos, please don't lynch me. <laughs> I was just giving my opinion. It is just a theory after all. As wrong as I think it may be, it is just a theory. But um, yeah, that's all for this video. I'm sorry if the uh, editing wasn't quite up to par. Uh, as some people were expecting. <laughs> I, it was just a quick thing I wanted to do. Uh, unscripted. Just something that I could put out there while I work on a few more speed paints. I'm also working on a video game review. I was going to make a movie review before I went away on vacation to Canada, as some of you guys may or may not know. But I lost all that footage and the images that I was going to use and I'm just too lazy to try to make it again because it was like a 20 minute video and I, I don't want to make it again so look forward to the other videos that I mentioned <laughs> and with that I will see you around but wait there's more so as of me recording this clip right now I totally forgot that I wanted to do this part at the end of the video so lately, even though we have such a small audience on pretty much every platform here, my DeviantArt or Twitter, we've gotten fan art, weirdly enough. And I just wanted to thank a few people that have drawn stuff for me and Fortuity. So thank you to Golden Tails for these cute little headshots of me and Fortuity. We both love them very much. Thank you to my friend Bree, known as Sleepy Shadow on my server for drawing me in the style of My Little Pony. I do not watch the show, but I love this drawing. It looks really good. And thank you to Battered Steve for making this cute little sketch of me in Fortuity. I love it so much, and so does he. If you're interested in seeing your art on this channel, consider joining the Discord server. There is a fan art chat, and you can post your stuff there. Or you can tweet at me and for on our Twitter. You can message me on Facebook. You can do all that stuff. So yeah, thank you guys for the fan art. I will see you guys in the next video.